Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more of the Great War. This time we're on to week 95 and Conrad's cunning plan. You already know how I feel about Conrad and his supreme intellect of military planning. Hiding in plain sight. Before we dive in, though, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Okay. Oh, this is... This isn't going to go well. This isn't... No, this is going to be bad. I already know it. Conrad does not have good plans. He has awful plans. He's stupid. Very stupid. Let's dive in. The Italian front has been active in bursts for the past year. Yes, with the uh, 100th Battle of the Asanzo River. Because, again, if it didn't work the first 90,000 times, it'll work the 90,000th and first times early. All of the big action being Italian uh. offensives. That pattern changes this week. For this week, the Austro-Hungarian Empire strikes back. Uh. Oh my god, so they'll do what the Italians have been doing. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week began the death march from Kut al Amara, when the 12,000 British and Indian troops who had surrendered to the Ottomans after a five-month siege began the long march to Anatolian prison camps. Meanwhile, Belgian and French citizens in German-occupied territory were being sent as workers to Germany. While at Verdun, where the battle raged on, the French began <coughs> preparations for a new offensive. The Italian front had been quiet, but it wasn't any longer. The Austrians had been passive for the past year on the Asanzo River, even after five battles of that river's name. General Svetasar Barojevich von Banya believed his best offense was a good defense. But this didn't sit so well with Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzen. No, of course not. I mean... We should totally listen to Konrad von Hotzendorf and his ideas because, you know, he's totally not been an absolute failure every step of the way. Now, he wanted to take the battle to the Italians, whom he considered traitors for joining the Entente powers. Toward the end of 1915, he had begun obsessing about an attack out of the Tyrol towards the sea. His forces would surge out onto the plains, and when they reached the sea near Venice, they would cut Italian supply lines. And unless Britain, Russia, or France could hurry to the rescue, Italy would fall. Well, that was the idea. He figured he'd need 16 divisions to have a two-to-one advantage over the Italians in the Trentino, which meant that he would need German help. So back, oh, of course he would. back in December, he'd sat down with German Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenhayn to argue his case. And Conrad felt that even if Italy didn't surrender, the front would be shortened so much that 200,000 Austrian troops would be freed up to fight elsewhere. Now, disregarding the fact that Germany was not actually at war with Italy at the time... Wait, really? What? Falkenhayn said no anyhow to sending German troops. For one, he thought that Conrad seriously underestimated the amount of men needed for success. And for two, he was planning his own big offensive at Verdun and didn't think it worthwhile to divert troops. But Conrad had a bee in his bonnet about his plan, and he had slowly been building up for it for months. He had Barojevich send over four of his best divisions and loads of heavy batteries. He had also taken five divisions from the front in Galicia against Russia, against Falkenhayn's express orders, hmm. and had managed to scrape together 15 total divisions and over a thousand pieces of artillery by March and had been waiting and waiting for the weather to allow his attack, which would have to capture ridges and peaks 2,000 meters high. The commander of the Italian troops in that sector was General Roberto Brusati. Well, I mean, okay, I guess at least Conrad is properly <clears throat> planning this time around. You know, it, it, you know, he's putting some time into it this time. Like, he's thinking things, maybe he's thinking things through now. Well, maybe he's had some character development since uh, the fighting in the Austrian-Hungarian mountains against Russia. In mid-February, he had said to Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna that an Austrian buildup was going on and asked for reinforcements. Cadorna said, no dice. In late March, Brusati said he expected an Austrian attack 
within days, and if it was serious, he had no reserves. Cadorna was skeptical, since he believed the Austrians were fighting a purely defensive war. And even in the face of detailed evidence from Austrian deserters who had documents about the buildup, Cadorna thought it was still all just a bluff. Oh my god. Cadorna is dumber than Conrad. I didn't think it possible. I didn't. Wow. By mid-April, wow. accurate estimates of the Austro-Hungarian forces massing were appearing in the Italian and French papers, but Cadorna remained unmoved. How can you be so stupid? How? How? Okay, he wasn't entirely stupid here. He d uh, Are we sure? Did write to French leader Joseph Joffre in late April and say that he thought the Austrians were up to something and asked for support, but the French were busy with Verdun. Cadorna also visited Trentino for the first time since September, but refused to meet Brusati in person. And then guess what? Cadorna appealed to the king and had Brusati sacked. And at dawn, on May the 15th, 1916, Conrad von Hotzendorf's big Austrian guns began to roar and the Trentino offensive had begun. And in spite of the preparations being written up in the press for all to see, Austria-Hungary still had the element of surprise, hmm. thanks to Cadorna. They overran the Italian lines on a front 20 kilometers long, and the Italians began to retreat. Cadorna scrabbled to transfer men over there as quickly as possible. The Italians were forced back throughout the week. They were pushed south of Rovereto the 15th. They evacuated Zugna Torta the 18th and retreated from the mountains. The Austrians claimed 6,300 prisoners. On the 19th, Italian representatives sent to the Stavka in Russia insisted that the Russians start offensive actions on the Eastern Front to take some pressure off of the Italians at once and threatened to make a separate peace with Austria if that didn't happen. On the 21st, the Italians start losing one front, start losing one battle, start, their troops start retreating one time en masse, and they freak out and they're like, we'll make a separate peace. What the fuck, Italy? <laughs> First, Italian King Victor Emmanuel would make the same appeal to the Tsar. But as the week ended, the Austrians were still coming on strong. Cadorna often sacked his generals, but there had been a shakeup in the French command recently as well. Yes. I haven't had time to mention it yet, but French Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre was regretting General Philippe Pétain's command at Verdun only weeks after giving it to him. To Joffre, Pétain had only seemed to surrender territory and was still not thinking of a major counterattack. And Pétain's demands were draining the resources Joffre wanted to use for the major Anglo-French offensive planned for the summer at the Somme. So a rift developed between the two. Pétain believed that if Verdun was to remain in French hands, that's where the major French effort of 1916 should be, and even began to suggest that the Somme should be left to the British alone. But Joffre couldn't just remove Pétain, who was by now idolized throughout France as the savior of Verdun. Hmm. At just the they're still fighting the battle, and they still and they're already calling him that. <laughs> Jeez, France, a little uh, quick on the trigger there. Same time as Joffre's popularity was at a new low. Enter General Robert Nivelle, a man whose, according to Alistair Horne, ambition was as boundless as his self-confidence. I'm going to paraphrase Horne here for a bit. Nivelle was actually a triumvirate. On one hand was his chief of staff, Major d'Alençon, a brilliant officer that was unfortunately dying of consumption and uh -huh. who made it his yep. personal mission to save France before he died, urging Nivelle into attack after attack. On the other hand was the toughest general in the whole French army, Charles Mangin, known to his men as the Butcher. He was a real frontline general who scorned fear and death and was wounded several times taking enormous and perhaps stupid risks. Hmm. Winston Churchill described him, reckless of all lives and of none more than his own, charging at the head of his troops, fighting rifle in his hand, became on the anvil of Verdun, the fiercest warrior figure of what? France. At the end of March, the triumvirate had been transferred to Verdun to command troops on the right bank of the Meuse River. 
and over the following weeks, they launched a multitude of small-scale attacks. Now, Horn says these were probably less effective than Pétain's defensive posture on the left bank, but Joffre was very impressed, and now he had an opportunity. Instead of firing Pétain, he promoted him. On April 19th, Pétain was told he was to take over Army Group Center, and Nivelle would take over the Second Army at Verdun. So Pétain would be in indirect control of things, but Nivelle would be on the spot. Pétain was furious, but what could he do? And on May the 1st, General Nivelle took over. And a little note about something that happened this week not too far from Verdun in Alsace. A German reconnaissance plane was shot down by a plane bearing the tricolor on its wings, but on the fuselage was painted the head of a Native American brave in full war feathers. The pilot was Kiffin Rockwell from Asheville, North Carolina, and this victory was the first scored by Escadrille Americaine, soon to be known as the Escadrille Lafayette, a French fighter squadron composed of American volunteers. The day after Rockwell became the first American to shoot down an enemy aircraft, the squadron was transferred to Verdun, where, within a week, Rockwell's exploits would make him the first American to win the French Legion d'Honneur. And here hmm. are a couple of notes to round out nice. the week. From the third but as we saw by the, with the year of his death, I don't think he's making it out of Verdun as a guest. ...18th to the 17th, Russian warships, seaplane carriers, and 50 transports transported 34,000 reinforcements to the Trabzon area. And this week, the Russians also advanced in North Persia, taking Rwandis the 15th, advancing on Mosul the 16th, and on the 20th, a group of Russian Cossacks met up with a small British force at Ali Gerbi on the upper Tigris River. So the week comes to an end, with American pilots in the skies over France, some Russian advances in the south, and a new Austro-Hungarian offensive, which nobody could have seen coming, even though everybody saw it coming. Hmm. Newspapers aren't always reliable, but when your nation's and your allies' nation's papers are printing frighteningly accurate accounts of the enemy's buildup for an attack, maybe it's the time to listen to your subordinates. Mm -hmm. But Luigi Cadorna did not listen to his subordinates, and when they questioned his judgment or leadership, he fired them. And now his armies and the Italian people were going to pay the bloody price. If you'd like to know more, about one of the Austrian commanders on the Italian front who would become known as the Lion of the Asanzo. You can click here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was Conrad's cunning plan, which actually seems to be working. Hiding in plain sight, the Great War Week 95. Uh, Luigi Cadorna is the biggest dumbass of the war so far. We'll see if that trend continues. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.